Good morning. I'm Mike Smith, Secretary of the Agency of Human Services. Governor Scott is currently on another call with fellow governors and White House officials, but he'll be joining us shortly. Today, I'll start out with an update of our statewide vaccination program, but I wanna take a moment and revisit the fact that COVID-19 has affected all of us. For example, one year, for one year, every Vermonter has needed to respond to the pandemic in one way or another by wearing a mask or staying six feet away from people we care about. We've come a long way in the past year. Today, we have three life-saving vaccines available to us and perhaps more to be approved in the future. As I stand here today, more than one in, in four adult Vermonters have received at least one dose of COVID-19 vaccine. And we are seeing a slow but steady increase in vaccine manufacturing and a decrease in deaths from the virus. This is remarkable and really speaks to how we have been able to really stick together and move toward overcoming the most devastating public health crisis in more than 100 years. Today, I'll provide you with an update on our progress with, state, with the statewide vaccination program. In terms of the overall progress, as of this morning, 152,800 people have been vaccinated against COVID-19. 70,100 have, re have received their first dose of vaccine. 82,700 have received their first and last doses of the vaccine. And among those 16 and above with high risk conditions, 25,400 people have made appointments. I encourage those that are eligible to make an appointment to do so via the state website, healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine, or by calling the Vaccine Call Center at 855-722-7878. Moving on, we continue to vaccinate teachers, school staff, and regulated childcare programs. And this week, this week we're in now, we'll vaccinate 7,000 individuals in this group through the state program. We are waiting on data from the federal pharmacy program, but we do know that they had nearly 5,000 doses available as well. This week, we have added clinics in Essex County, Franklin, and Orange Counties. As a reminder, these groups can make an appointment through the state system um, when an educator's vac vaccination clinic has been scheduled, or they can make an appointment at Walgreens, CVS, or Kinney's and bring their confirmation email to their appointment. The state website is healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine, which also has a link of the pharmacy's websites. Incarcerated individuals age 18 and over with eligible high-risk conditions will be vaccinated starting this week. We anticipate completing this group of approximately 185 eligible individuals in the next two to three weeks. CVS pharmacy locations in Barrie and Morrisville began vaccinating uh, Vermonters over the weekend. This week, the CVS in Bennington will begin vaccinating Vermonters. As you, you can make an appointment at CVS locations by visiting our healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine website or the CVS website at cvs.com. Other CVS pharmacy locations will begin to schedule clinics as additional vaccine allocations become available through the federal uh, retail pharmacy program. In closing, I wanna share that we uh, have a community vaccination site in Beecher Falls on March 29th, and appointments are still available at that vaccination community vaccination site. I would encourage you, um, if you're living in that area, uh, to sign up by going to the state website one more time, healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine, or by calling the vaccine center at 855-722-7878. I'll now turn it over to uh, Secretary Young for an overview of the American Rescue Plan.
Good morning. Thank you, Secretary Smith. Uh, my name is Suzanne Young. I'm the Secretary of Administration. And today I will provide an overview of some of the key provisions in the American Rescue Plan, focusing on those that will be most immediately available to Vermonters. Just by way of background, the plan was signed into law by President Biden just five days ago on Thursday, March 11. I'd like to add my thank you to our congressional delegation for their strong advocacy for Vermont and Vermonters throughout the pandemic. The American Rescue Plan is expected to provide $2.7 billion in state aid. This is the third major piece of federal legislation that provides emergency, individual, and economic relief to the state. Vermont businesses and institutions, nonprofits, uh, and individual Vermonters. The rescue plan brings the total federal relief to Vermont to approximately $7.5 billion since the first month of the pandemic. The American Rescue Plan is a package of aid. Some of it is appropriated to federal agencies to administer and some of it to state and local governments to administer. In other words, there is some aid that will be provided directly through federal programs and some that will be provided through state programs. There are many details we do not yet have, the res have with respect to implementation of some initiatives in the bill. We await additional plan details and federal guidance and rules that apply to a number of the programs funded in the plan. So for clarification, my comments are in no way intended to be a comprehensive or complete review of the American Rescue Plan. But I will begin by highlighting today the provisions of the bill that will bring assistance most quickly to individuals, businesses, nonprofits, and local government. So first, let me focus on some assistance contained in the bill that will get immediate help to individual Vermonters. The most immediate assistance is another economic stimulus payment that eligible taxpayers will receive directly from the IRS. The state has no direct involvement in this payment. This is a $1,400 payment per adult and each dependent for taxpayers with an adjusted gross income of less than $75,000 for single filers and $150,000 for joint filers. The payment will phase out for adjusted gross income above $80,000 for single filers and $160,000 for joint filers. The IRS will use your most recent tax return filed and processed. So if taxpayers haven't filed their 2020 returns, the IRS will or has already used your 2019 return to determine payments. When will this happen? Well, some direct deposits are already pending in Vermonters' accounts, so check your bank balances to see if it has arrived. Checks or prepaid debit cards for others will be mailed by the IRS through the United States Postal Service in the coming weeks. We expect, again, further guidance to be issued by the IRS to address the expected what-if questions, so continue to monitor the IRS website, www.irs.gov. You can also track payment status and apply for a payment if you qualify but are not required to file a tax return. So again, www.irs.gov slash coronavirus slash get hyphen my hyphen payment uh, to track your payment and the status of any claim you may have filed. Second, there is tax exemption, a tax exemption that anyone who received unemployment compensation in 2020 should be pursuing right now. The American Rescue Plan excludes from taxation the first $10,200 of unemployment compensation received in 2020 for all taxpayers who have less than $150,000 in adjusted gross income. This is an unprecedented retroactive exclusion and is a very valuable one. And we want to make sure taxpayers are aware and are taking steps to claim the exclusion on this year's tax return. The $10,200 exclusion is a per person exclusion. So a qualifying married couple could exclude up to $20,400, but only if they each received at least $10,200 in unemployment compensation. 
taxpayers will claim this exemption on their federal returns. One of the obvious questions here is what do I do if I filed my federal tax return before the exemption became effective in law last week? This past weekend, the IRS issued guidance for taxpayers who did just that and advised that if you have already filed your 2020 return, you should not file an amended return at this time, but wait for further guidance from the IRS on how to claim this exemption. For those who have not filed, you should check with the IRS or your tax preparer about how to claim the exemption when you file. There are answers to frequently asked questions about this exemption, again, on the IRS website, www.irs.gov. For this exemption to follow through, however, and apply to Vermont tax filings, the Vermont legislature will have to act and pass a corresponding exemption under the Vermont tax code. The administration is discussing the possibility of including this in a current legislation uh, pending today. So again, um, for further information, you should check with the IRS uh, about these two immediately available benefits. I'll now just turn briefly to the unemployment benefit payment expansion in the federal bill. The American Rescue Plan extends the $300 federal pandemic unemployment compensation benefit through September 6, 2021. And it extends the pandemic emergency unemployment compensation to that same date while increasing the total number of weeks of benefits available from 24 to 53. It also provides 100% subsidy of COBRA payments from April 1, 2021 to September 30, 2021 for individuals who lost their jobs and are eligible for COBRA. Now, less immediate but as important, there are a variety of additional tax credit expansions that will help individuals that will be available in next year's filing, that is for the 2021 filing. And just briefly, these credits include expansion of the earned income tax credit. The rescue plan raises the earned income tax credit for workers without children and lowers the age of eligibility for the credit. Again, this will require the Vermont legislature to provide the exemption uh, to Vermonters. The federal child tax credit uh, in the American Rescue Plan was increased from $2,000 to $3,000 for every child age 6 to 17 and $3,600 for every child under the age of 6. The IRS will also pay out a portion of this credit throughout the latter part of 2021, so again, you should check with the IRS. Um, this is a pure federal tax with no Vermont impact. And then finally, there's an expansion of the child and dependent care um, credit, which is different than the child tax credit, but is used to offset work-related dependent care costs. This credit was expanded for tax year 2021 and is fully re uh, refundable. Again, we will be working with the legislature to pass a corresponding tax credit to Vermont tax liability. So the Vermont Tax Department will keep Vermonters informed of any developments with these tax provisions as they become available and you should check their website frequently. Turning to some uh, highlights in the Housing and Human Services sections of the Act, there's additional funding for, for many benefits. We expect individuals to benefit from a number of enhanced or extended programs. Most immediately, uh, the Act includes an expansion of nutrition assistance through the SNAP program, an expansion of the emergency provision of meals to school children for 90 days into this summer, and increased grants for eligible child care providers. For those individuals who are struggling to pay their rent, their mortgage, and utility payments, the American Rescue Plan provides funding for emergency assistance to help with these challenges, as well as an expansion of the LIHEAP Fuel Assistance Program. These programs are all federally funded programs that are administered by the state. So more information will be provided by the agencies and departments who administer those programs. For small businesses and nonprofits, there are several opportunities for assistance in the American Rescue Plan. Many of these will not be administered by the state, but by the Small Business Administration or other organizations, such as banks. But they do include an expansion of eligibility for the Paycheck Protection Program for nonprofits, 
the addition of funding for targeted economic injury disaster loans, grant funds to restaurants and other food service industry businesses, and funds for the Shuttered Venue Operations Grant Program. Again, as program details become available from our federal partners, we will share these with you. Please pay attention to the website of the Small Business Administration for updates, as well as the website for the Agency of Commerce and Community Development. Finally, there is much opportunity for continued economic recovery contained in an appropriation in the state and local government relief provisions of the American Rescue Plan. The appropriation for state and local government relief totals $1.36 billion, and it is directed to state and local governments. This is similar to the relief provided in the CARES Act last year that created the $1.25 billion coronavirus relief fund that the state was required to spend in the original bill by the end of 2020. There are some significant differences, however, between this bill and the Coronavirus Relief Fund. First, the appropriation includes a carve-out of $191 million for cities, towns, and villages. Because of its size, the City of Burlington will receive a direct payment from the U.S. Treasury of $19 million. The remaining money, in Vermont's case, will go to units of local government, meaning cities, towns, and villages. The state is directed to distribute the money directly to these local governments. Because Vermont does not have county governance, the county share of funds will be divided between the local units of government within each county based on a population formula. This money will come to the state in two pieces. The first 50% is expected this spring, and the second no less than a year from now, or as early as 2022. We have not done the calculations yet as to how much each city, town, and village will be awarded once the county share is allocated and the local units of government within its boundaries, uh, but we will. We do not know when the state will receive this funding, but when we do, we will have 30 days to distribute it to the municipalities with the opportunity to request extensions if needed. But make no mistake, it will be our goal to distribute the funds as soon after its arrival as possible. And we look forward to working with our villages, cities, towns, and the League of Cities and Towns to make this happen. The second notable difference between the money and prior coronavirus relief funds are that the eligible uses of the money are expanded. Not only can the money be used by local governments to respond to the public health emergency, its negative economic impacts and premium pay, the eligible uses were expanded to include revenue replacement for losses due to COVID and necessary investments in water, sewer, or broadband infrastructure. Another difference from the CRF money is that this time we have nearly four years from March 3rd to expend it until December 31, 2024. This means that with the exception for emergency and immediate needs to respond to the pandemic and its economic impacts, there's some time for local government to thoughtfully plan around the best uses of what we hope will be the bulk of this money pandemic providing. Finally, the state will receive $1.16 billion to spend on eligible uses. Again, the expanded uses mentioned previously also apply to the state. We expect all but $113 million to be delivered to the state in either one or two pieces. While we know with certainty from the language of the act that we will only receive 50% of the money for local governments this spring, the Secretary of Treasury has the discretion to send the state its entire amount or at one time or to hold some back for at least a year. We do not know yet what the decision will be for Vermont or when it will be made. 
The remaining $113 million has been set aside for critical capital projects. The state will have to apply for this money and there's no guidance or application process stood up yet. While we do know, what we do know is that the projects proposed must be critical to directly enabling work, education, and health monitoring, including remote options in response to the COVID emergency. Again, as with the local money, and after emergency immediate needs are taken care of, there is much opportunity to be thoughtful in our approach to spending this money in a way that benefits Vermont and its economy in the long run. This state and local money provides some meaningful, meaningful opportunities to continue to build out broadband in our state. The ability to use some of the state and local money for broadband infrastructure coupled with the governor's proposal to use one-time surplus this year uh, in the legislature, pending in the legislature, plus federal money that may become available through the emergency connectivity fund created in the American Rescue Plan will get us much closer to achieving our broadband expansion goals. So I'll conclude here with the acknowledgement again that I have just scratched the surface of the details of the $2.7 billion American Rescue Plan. There are many details still to learn, federal guidance and rules to be issued, and conversations with the legislature to be had about the path forward to spend the, the relief money in the most strategic way to put all of Vermont on a solid economic foundation for the future. We will keep you informed every step of the way. I will now turn this over to Commissioner Pishak. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Secretary Young, and good morning, everybody. Today I want to start with an overview of the single greatest item that's impacting our COVID-19 data and certainly impacting our outlook which is the number of Vermonters who have been willing to be vaccinated to date. For the past year, we have all wondered when the pandemic might end. And quite simply, this chart here holds the key. The higher these percentages go, the faster and more normal our recovery will be. And so far, the uptake among our most vulnerable populations has been impressive. More than 84% of our 75 and older population has started or completed vaccination, higher than the national average, which is closer to 71%. The percentage of the population 70 to 74 who have started or completed their vaccination increased 25% this week and now stands at over 80% as well. And the percentage of the 65 to 69 year olds nearly doubled this week and now stands at 50% who have either started or completed vaccination, with thousands more scheduled to get the vaccine in the days ahead. And even though Vermont is one of the oldest states in terms of the percent of its population over 65, we are one of the leading states in terms of the vaccination percentage among this population. And we're seeing the direct impact in our data and these early uptake percentages indicate uh, a strong performance and bode well for Vermont in the weeks and months ahead. Looking at Vermont's vaccination progress, uh, this week we administered over 7,000 vaccines on a single day, which was the highest uh, that we've done uh, since the start of the program. And our seven day average is now over 5,000 daily vaccines administered, a 20% increase compared to last week. This week, we'll report 791 new COVID-19 cases, a reduction of over 100 cases when compared to last week. And also today, Vermont passes the 17,000 total case threshold, which still represents the lowest aggregate number of cases in the country and the second lowest per capita numbers in the country since the start of the pandemic. You can see that the seven-day average has been coming down from where it was last week, standing then at over 130 cases on a seven-day average and is now back down to 108 cases uh, on that average. Again, we can see that the COVID-19 outbreak at the Newport prison contributed to the rise in cases over the past two weeks. And without that outbreak, our seven-day average would have been more stable. 
Looking beyond these top line case metrics, we continue to see encouraging signs in our data. First, over the past few months, we have seen a gradual and steady decline in the median age of an individual contracting COVID-19 in Vermont, down from 44 years old at the end of November to 32 years old today. Our median age is getting younger because fewer vulnerable Vermonters are contracting the virus. Looking at long-term care facility residents, you can see that the increase in infections that we saw from November through January has now significantly decreased with uh, our statewide numbers continuing to remain high. In fact, we've only reported six long-term care facility cases in the last three weeks and have just two active outbreaks. And these active outbreaks are considerably smaller when compared to outbreaks we were experiencing in long-term care facilities earlier in the year and last December. Looking more broadly, the 70 year and older population uh, continues to see fewer cases on a per capita basis compared to the under 70 crowd. And we anticipate that the 65 to 69 year old population, since they're standing now at about 50% who have started or completed vaccination, uh, and that percentage is increasing quickly, we anticipate to see fewer cases among this age group also in the weeks to come. Turning to college cases, we see that we're reporting 59 new cases this week, uh, which is pretty much in line with the weekly numbers that we've seen uh, so far this spring semester. The Vermont case forecast continues to remain stable with the short-term projection anticipating that cases will remain on average around 100 per day, but the longer-term projection indicates that cases will start to decrease over time and this longer term projection incorporates the increase in vaccination that we'll see over time and anticipates cases will start to fall toward the beginning of April and fall again more rapidly throughout that month. Turning to Vermont's uh, hospitalization metrics, we continue to see fewer people on average in the ICU with COVID-19, which is certainly an encouraging sign. At the same time, however, we are seeing that hospitalizations generally have flattened out over the past week with us averaging between 25 and 30 individuals in the hospital statewide. Again, we do anticipate this number to fall uh, as we make further progress uh, vaccinating those with underlying conditions and those in their 70s and 60s and younger. Looking at our COVID-19 death forecast, we are still fortunately seeing favorable indicators. As I mentioned, the number of cases at long-term care facilities is down. Cases among the 70 and older population is also down. And we're trending down in ICU and ventilator usage as well. With these indicators still trending favorably, our most important metric, the number of deaths in Vermont, is anticipated to continue to improve. Eight Vermonters have died so far this month, uh, but we anticipate that this will end up being a step down in March compared to the numbers we have seen in previous recent months. Taking a quick look around the region and the country, we see that the Northeast is essentially reporting the same number of cases this week as it did last week with a very small decrease. Comparing the Northeast to the rest of the regions in the country, uh, you can see that we are experiencing higher case counts over the past two weeks compared certainly to the South and to the West, and that we've also had basically flat growth during that period of time. However, our other regional metrics continue to improve, including the positivity rate, hospitalization rate, and most importantly, the fatality rate. Regional uh, forecast indicates that uh, cases are anticipated to continue to decline across the region as more and more people are vaccinated and as the weather continues to improve. Again, all of which is good news for Vermont. Finally, looking at our national numbers, we see that cases have continued to decrease, albeit slowly, down 8% over the last 10 days and national hospitalizations and deaths are also continuing their decrease, with hospitalizations down 8% over the past 10 days, while deaths have decreased over 21% during that same period of time, again, indicating that the most vulnerable across the country are also getting that benefit of the protection of the vaccine. At this time, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Levine. Thank you, Commissioner Pichak. 
Our cases do indeed continue to be reported in a fairly steady range, anywhere from 50 to 80 to 130 to 175 uh, cases a day. Today, we are reporting a slight downtick in the hospitalizations to 24, three patients in the ICU, and a positivity rate 1.3 percent. I'm focusing on the range of cases for a couple of reasons. One, because we know that one day's report does not reflect the trend. And two, because this has been and is expected to be the reality over the next several weeks before we see that drop towards the end of the month. We've made great progress in vaccination so far, with more than 26 percent of Vermonters vaccinated. But it will take some time to see an impact on COVID-19 cases as our vaccination program ramps up with more doses allocated and more Vermonters protected. What's important is that we are seeing fewer cases in our older age groups, as you just saw. Large portions of those groups have now been vaccinated, so there's far less risk of severe illness, hospitalizations, and death. Ultimately, we would hope to see the same benefits for those with high-risk conditions and those in the next age bands as well. Now, one of the things I've been talking about with vaccine is that no matter what level we record the efficacy at, anywhere from 66 to 95 percent, the greatest benefit you should be watching for is the vaccine's efficacy in preventing serious illness, hospitalizations, and death. Just what we're seeing in Vermont. Perhaps you might still get mild illness. This is how many vaccines work, including the flu vaccine. Well, recently published evidence shows there is much less likelihood of having an asymptomatic infection as well. For patients presenting for COVID testing through the PCR test and the nasal swab prior to a procedure, those who were vaccinated with at least one dose of COVID-19 vaccine had a 56 percent reduction in positive PCR results. And after two doses, the effect was even greater, an 80 percent reduction. The authors stated that these results are consistent with previously published data showing a reduction in asymptomatic infection following vaccination with an mRNA vaccine, even after one dose. The other topic I'd like to talk about today is the variant strains. We've just received more results from last week's uh, submitted specimens for whole genome sequencing which is used to determine whether variant strains are circulating. From those results, we found four more positives for the B117 UK variant strain, giving us a total of five now in the state. Not unusual, I should add, when you look across the country. As we've said before, the discovery of these variants should really drive us all to more strongly adhere to the prevention steps we're already taking. Remember, masks on faces, six-foot spaces, uncrowded places. Perhaps take a look at your mask to see if you can get a better fit, or even double mask. The CDC website will show you how. Or if you're visiting somewhere with a lot of people, come back later when it's less crowded. And as always, if you don't feel well, stay at home. The choices that we make can make a big difference for ourselves, our loved ones, and our communities. The variants of concern we found here make the virus spread more easily from person to person. And we need to do everything we can to stop that spread, to reduce the chances for additional mutations and strains. Fortunately, these variants have not had serious impact on health outcomes, hospitalizations, or deaths at this time in the United States. However, there is now peer-reviewed information published in England on the UK B117 variant, 
which does provide the first indication that this variant may be more deadly. But, according to the study, only minimally so. Though the headline states a 64% increased risk of death, when one looks at the absolute risk of death, it only increased from 2.5 to 4.1 deaths per 1,000 cases. So while I want you to be cautious and follow all of the public health guidance, I also want you to put this information in perspective. In the U.S., with, even with variants being detected, we are seeing decreased hospitalizations, deaths, and no surges or reinfections. All of this is why we can take deliberate steps towards reopening. If we can limit the amount of virus that is circulating in our communities, stay ahead of community spread, get tested if we have symptoms or think we might have been exposed, we can get through this critical stage together until we all have that chance we've been waiting for to protect ourselves and each other through vaccination. Since the governor is not yet completed with his call, we'll begin the uh, media part of the uh, conference now. Um, thanks, Dr. Levine. So probably a, a question for Secretary Smith, and maybe yourself too, but you know, last week you mentioned that the state is uh, soon going to be standing up clinics for BIPOC Vermonters and their families. Um, I'm wondering just first off, you know, what information you can share, you know, whether we have any details of when these will be, where these will be, and uh, which, which vaccine will be given as well. Yes, so to start with, I believe we're having one today, actually. Perhaps, if not today, it's within the next day or two in Burlington. There's another one being scheduled for next week in Addison County. And there are several others that are still in the planning stage, and I can't give you the exact date. The um, vaccine that's being used is the same vaccine most of us can all get because it's the one that's available, which is the mRNA vaccines, Pfizer and Moderna. And uh, was that all your questions? Yeah, and then, you know, you, so you've mentioned that, you know, in the past, getting word out to a lot of BIPOC Vermonters, um, you know, you, you reached out to community leaders and other people as well. Um, I'm wondering, you know, how, how that's been and, you know, whether you think that the right people are hearing this messaging from the state. Yeah, good. So, Obviously, there's the one methodology which is just look at our website, because I promise people that there will be information on there in a timely way. The second, though, is through our community partner organizations who are helping us work with the BIPOC community itself to inform them of the opportunities that are available. So they're helping us in the beginning um, provide those opportunities, if you will, and set up the clinics, and they will also be working to provide the community with a notion of where and when it is and make sure they get signed up. I might have one just quick follow up to the governor if possible, but sure. Thank you. Steve? Um, this one may be for Mike. Uh, on the housing uh, for the homeless folks, uh, where are we at with that? We've uh, had several instances of. Uh, of problems, especially up here, we hear mostly about the problems at the uh, the end at the top of the hill here in Berlin. Um, last week, getting a little bit more serious with uh, with a fire and a woman being uh, pretty critically injured. Uh, frustrations, or where where are we at with that? Well, as you know, Steve, at the start of the pandemic, we made a um, we made a commitment to sort of make sure that we house those that were homeless. And so we expanded our hotel motel program and we're housing approximately 2,500 individuals now. Uh, those are adults and kids into hotel motels across the state. Um, we have to transition as we come out of this emergency, we're going to have to transition uh, to another um, program and uh, we're looking at that right now we I had a meeting with um, with committee chairs of the money committees the other day 
We're looking at forming a working group so that we can all come to consensus of what that's going to look like as we move out of, uh, out of the emergency. So I, I would say stay tuned for the details. I mean, we had a plan that we, we had submitted. Um, I think it ran into some uh, opposition at the legislative level. We're trying to work this out now. But I think you're going to have to see three components out of this plan. You're going to have to see um, permanent housing. You're going to have to see more shelters. And you're going to have to see, as, as we started this program, we took off the limits to or the, the various qualification eligibility limits that we had on the program, we're going to have to replace, we're going to have to bring those back in. Um, what they look like, we'll work out with the legislature on, but we'll, certainly we're going to have to have some sort of criteria as we move forward. So those are the three things we're working. Um, we, we met yesterday, we said we'll form a working group and try to have something before the end of the session so that and the timing will work out too because about that time you know the vaccination program should be really rolling along and we should be really um, starting to look at, at how we exit this and how we exit this program is there some sort of a, a law enforcement component that should be put into this thing uh, as far as we, you know, keeping other people in the buildings yeah. uh, that you're housing them in safe. We, we have a security uh, component that we spend uh, quite a bit of money on uh, at these facilities. Um, we're looking at what happened in Berlin and seeing if we have to beef up something uh, there in particular. Um, it's been very uh, discouraging of what happened there, and we just got to figure out uh, where we move forward with that facility and where we move forward with the program in that area. Uh, moving to the phones to Stewart, NBC5. Thanks, uh, good morning. I wanna ask a question forwarded to me by a, a manufacturing facility in Franklin County who um, asked a pretty good question. They, they were saying they are diligently following the most recent return to work guidance uh, but that was provided last May and seems outdated given all of the changes that have occurred with uh, the state's approach to COVID since then. Um, so the question is, when can the manufacturing sector in Vermont expect an update on return to work guidance uh, that they have been operating under since, you know, last spring? I'll, I'll turn to ACCD for that. You bet. Hi, uh, this is Secretary Curley. Thank you for the question. Um, yes, you know, our teams have been, uh, there's been many sectors actually that have been sort of in the same posture for a, a really long time. And um, our team's been you know, busy working with the Department of Health and the Department of Public Safety to identify how we're going to come out of this crisis in the next few months. So you've probably heard the governor talk about uh, uh, mentioning a plan for exit and something that you know he hopes to roll out in the next few weeks. So they can expect to see more information, I would say, sometime in the next few weeks on uh, a change of posture. Okay, so in the works. Um, speaking of returning to work, will bartenders be returning to work or are you waiting Secretary O. Smith until after St. Patrick's Day. We're, uh, again, you know, we're trying to, uh, you know, as Dr. Levine has said, conditions on the ground in March are still very concerning. And so we're just waiting until we have a little bit more time under our belt. But you're going to be, again, hearing more about bars in the very near future. All right. Thank you very much. And the governor is here, so he will go ahead and deliver his update, and then we'll get back to the Q&A. I'm sorry, Miss Stewart's uh, question. But, uh, <laughs> uh, good morning, everyone. I uh, just got off from our eighth call with uh, fellow governors in the White House, and we did hear some positive news. Uh, this is the first update we received since the president's speech last week, where he said that all Americans need to be eligible to register for vaccination by May 1st. As I said last week, we have a scheduled mapped out uh, that not only meets this goal, but could exceed it. 
uh, but this is 100 percent dependent on the supply from the federal government. And it's one thing to say everyone is eligible. Um, it's just it's quite another uh, to have the supply to actually get shots in arms. And as I said, if we get the doses we need, we'll exceed the goal. So here's what we heard today. Uh, first, uh, we were updated on the supply. So this week and next week, Pfizer and Moderna uh, will increase to 16 million nationwide for the state supplies, which will mean an increase of about 550 doses for Vermont. Uh, the federal pharmacy program, which is uh, that's their direct um, um, supply to the to the pharmacies, will see a 100,000 dose increase of Pfizer and Moderna, and 150,000 of uh, Johnson and Johnson, which means roughly another 250 doses for us. They also allocate uh, 400,000 Johnson and Johnson uh, doses this week. Uh, which is good news because we didn't expect any last week. They had told us that it would, uh, we would not be receiving uh, a supply of Johnson Johnson. So these increases means a total of about 800 additional doses for Vermont uh, next week. Um, and they said the following week uh, that it would be flat. Uh, so uh, the good news here is it won't be a decrease. But beginning the week of March 29th, Pfizer and Moderna, that this is what they expect, uh, will be in the 16 to 17 million range and will also get into a steady flow of Johnson & Johnson with four to six million a week uh, by the end of April, six million by the end of April. So it'll start off around four million. Uh, so that equates to an increase of about uh, four to 5,000 doses uh, for Vermont. So. In April, uh, we were told national allocation of all doses should continue to increase as time goes on. So this is the uh, assurance we've been waiting for. And we'll use this information to update our projections. And on Friday, we'll announce when our next age ban, 60 plus, will open. And with these uh, assurances on supply, I'll also be able to outline the full schedule for all remaining age bands in order to accomplish making every Vermonter over the age of 16 eligible by the end of April. Or by the, uh, yeah, by the end of April. And again, I want to remind folks, this doesn't mean that everyone will be fully vaccinated by May 1st. It just means they can sign up. That's what the president had promised and that's what we believe we can deliver on and possibly exceed. But as you'll see, if supply comes in as promised, we hope anyone who wants a vaccine will have the opportunity to be fully vaccinated by the summer, which will allow us to get back to normal, I believe back to normal by the 4th of July. In the meantime, as you've heard from Dr. Levine as well, while we make progress through vaccinations, it's as important as ever to continue following basic health guidance. Uh, we need to get through this as we vaccinate others, which means wearing masks, keeping your distance, avoiding crowds, and also getting tested, uh, which is still a really important tool for us here in the state. So with that, we'll get back to questions. All right, I'll just check in with Stuart. Were you all set, Stuart, or did you have another question? I thought he was set. <laughs> We'll go to Lisa at the AP. Uh, thank you. Governor, some UVM students have complained about conditions on campus related to COVID rules and excessive sus suspensions and uh, monitoring of student behavior. Um, I know UVM is now reviewing some of those suspensions. And do you have a comment about that, what's happening there? Well, I think we have to go back uh, and look, remember where we were uh, back last fall, uh, and we weren't sure, and the, the college and universities uh, were asking whether we were going to allow uh, them to come back at all. Uh, we were skeptical in some respects because we knew that cases were going to continue to rise. We had no vaccination on the horizon, and uh, at least at that point, and uh, we wanted to make sure that we were protecting Vermonters. I think Burlington in particular had a lot of concern about all the students coming back. Uh, so we worked with all the colleges and universities with uh, uh, 
former President Rich Snyder, and uh, they got together with all of the university and college pre uh, presidents, and we came up with a plan, and we asked them uh, to put together some sort of contract uh, that they could impose on the students that were coming back in. So students came in uh, with their eyes wide open. Uh, they knew what the contract was, uh, and I don't know the particulars, uh, but they, it was stringent. Uh, and that was necessary for, uh, to give us comfort uh, for them to come back. Uh, as a result, I think they were successful over the last uh, couple of, uh, uh, you know, few months. Um, and we've seen, you know, relative to others across the country, they've done very, very well. So these were contracts that were signed and, and agreed upon uh, by students. So it was nothing that they didn't know about. So, uh, you know, I'm in uh, on the side of fairness, obviously, uh, but I'm with the with the uh, uh, UVM on this one. Uh, I think that uh, uh, some of what we heard happened when kids, uh, and maybe not in all instances, but when when these students, these young adults, uh, went and circumvented uh, the restrictions in place by renting a, a room at a, at a hotel and packing a bunch of students in. And that's, that's exactly what we didn't want to happen because that leads to community spread of the virus and puts people at risk, especially before we had the vaccination plan in place where we were protecting older Vermonts, uh, Vermonters in particular. So again, I, uh, I support uh, the uh, UVM um, president and others on this in the administration, uh, but um, we'll see where it goes from here. And uh, but again, but I, I just want to remind everyone, they knew what they were getting into. They they agreed to the contract to come back into school. So I think uh, uh, the the uh, oversight was necessary. Okay. Thank you. Lisa, the Valley Reporter. Good afternoon. Good morning, I guess it still is. Uh, Governor Scott, is there a specific metric that you're looking for for um, no longer extending the state of emergency? Are there specific criteria, a per percent of vaccinated people, or will you use other metrics such as decline in cases to cancel? Yeah, you know, the state of emergency, again, is a vehicle uh, for us to unwind where we are now and we'll continue to need it for a bit longer. Um, I'm projecting, again, that we'll be back to normal uh, sometime before the 4th of July or there um, soon thereafter. Um, but I think we'll need that and we may need it beyond the state of emergency beyond that. But from my perspective, <clears throat> the sooner the better. Uh, but uh, but as we'll, uh, you'll see uh, in the next couple of weeks, we'll be able to to publicly um, uh, show you, uh, make this visible and transparent uh, about the benchmarks and so forth that we need to see as we unwind uh, where we are right now, unwind and get out of this state of emergency. So I would expect uh, you'll see the state of emergency over the next uh, <clears throat> three months uh, until we get to a point where everyone uh, who can, uh, who wants a vaccine uh, can have one, uh, and that way we're protecting uh, the vast majority of the population. So um, that's where I see it, and, uh, but time will tell. Uh, but, uh, but again, in two weeks, we'll be able to, to show you uh, what our plan is and uh, to present that to you. Thank you, and my second question is for Secretary Smith. It's a nuts and bolts question. Would it be possible to get the estimated number of people in the 60 and over age band, those in the 55 and older age band, those in the 50 and older age band, et cetera, so that those in their 20s and 30s can count down how many people before they get their shots? Yeah. And hey Lisa, if you just, um, if you'll be patient, we'll put that out on Friday and you can, you can see when you're going to get your shots. Great. That's all for me. Thank you very much. Greg, the county courier. Thank you, Rebecca. Good afternoon, Governor. Uh, looking at the state's vaccine dashboard, it seems that there are two counties that, that are really lagging in distribution in, in getting vaccines into people's arms. Uh, by population, there's about 50% more 
uh, more likely to get a vaccine in Rutland County than you are if you live in Essex County. Uh, and, and Franklin County isn't much farther ahead than, than Essex County. Um, obviously, this is due to the accessibility of vaccines. And, and I did hear earlier that you're rolling out more vaccine locations in Essex and Franklin County. Um, but it also seems that the part of this is, in, is uh, related to the mentality of, of a good number of people in these counties and maybe an educational aspect. I'm wondering what the state is doing to uh, to improve the educational aspect of these vaccines to to more rural communities that are that are uh, lack, lacking in the vaccine rate. Um, and and I'm also wondering if it's possible to get a breakdown of the vaccination rate by town. Um, I don't know about your last question, uh, but I'll let others try and answer that. Um, from my standpoint, it's a combination of uh, both. Um, I think making sure uh, that people see the benefits of receiving a vaccine, I think is important uh, that this is a, you know, it's like a, a, a pathway to, to more freedom, more mobility. I think it's, uh, it's good for all of us uh, to make sure that we take advantage of this uh, when we can, but there'll be a point when, uh, when the vast majority of, of people are offered in Vermont, we hope is a high percentage of uh, uptake that people will want the vaccine and we'll continue to educate the best we can. We'll, we'll be working on that with the health department and others and, and as well with the, um, some of the coalitions that we have out there, whether it's the, the Chamber of Commerce's, uh, the, the, uh, the trade groups and so forth uh, to try and convince their membership that this is a good idea. It's good for all of us, good for them personally, uh, but also for their families and who they might interact with. So we'll continue uh, with that. The other part of uh, the equation, we talked a little bit about this. And I heard other governors asking questions on the call that was just on with the White House. And, and part of, um, you know, when you're talking about rural states, and this came from rural states, and I, I would say that we're one of them, um, they put a lot of emphasis on the federal pharmacy progr programs and, and that they have a direct contract with them. Well, not everyone has a pharmacy uh, on every corner in their area. So what they're seeing in other states and what we're seeing here is uh, a lot of the, uh, the, so the supply goes to the, the pharmacies, but they aren't able to distribute because they don't have any facilities in some of the rural uh, parts of the state. So these governors, the other governors were saying, you know, we could use some of that supply because we are going to mobilize and get uh, the supply out uh, to those uh, those parts of the state as well. So uh, the White House said that they were listening uh, to see what they could do to help in that situ situation. And I know that we need to do better. And uh, as Secretary Smith had said, uh, we want to make sure that we get out to the rural parts of the state and meet them where they are. And maybe that will um, equate to more of an uptake and, uh, and, and more people wanting to get the vaccination. Anything you want to offer? Secretary Smith. Yeah, we do look at the uh, county statistics on a regular basis to see where we need to sort of put more effort. I think there's two things that um, we're, we're doing, uh, particularly in Essex County. The, the average of started percent started or completed in the state is about 26.9% as, as uh, Commissioner Levine, uh, Levine had talked about. In Essex, that's 20.6. So as you saw today, um, we, have a we have a community clinic up there that hasn't filled up. So I was trying to make sure that people understand that that clinic's there so that it could fill up. We also added a clinic for education up in that area. We're also really cognizant that we um, need, as you saw with Commissioner Pichek's uh, graphs, we don't have this problem at the high at the higher age limits in terms of participation, but as we go down the age limits, I think 
we're going to have to do more outreach, and we're anticipating that right now, and we're putting a plan together to do more educational outreach in terms of vaccines and making sure that people understand the benefits of vaccine. Not only are you protecting yourself, you're protecting others as well. So I think you'll see that roll out in the next few weeks in terms of making sure that that informational campaign is up and running at the same time. Thank you. Uh, I'm not sure if this next question is for Secretary French uh, or Dr. Levine. Um, we heard last week that Missisquoi Valley High School was going to have to end their sports season. Now we're hearing that Rice High School is withdrawn from the D1 boys hockey tournament. Uh, hearing that some other schools may end up having to do that, including Essex High School, from their hockey tournament. I'm wondering, what, what schools are you aware of, uh, Dr. French, that are uh, in, in limbo, I guess, so to speak? Yeah, hi, Greg. Um, well, I, I can comment specifically on the Cisco. I think, you know, your question was blending more into the sports, which I think is, uh, you know, so some hard, some hard decisions relative to playoffs and what have you. but. Uh, I did connect with the Missisco superintendent uh, on yeah, Monday, it must have been yesterday, I guess, um, and we discussed her situation, and it is a function of uh, community spread, essentially, and, uh, you know, a lot of the virus in the community, so therefore it's showing up in the schools. Sports teams have been part of that. Um, but I think there is also concern about uh, people not wearing their masks and so forth, so it's, it's a difficult situation for the school, and hopefully... Um, you know, this should serve as a lesson for people that uh, we still need to follow those mitigation procedures, even even with vaccine vaccine being deployed. But I know there's a lot of instability right now in the tournament, but I don't have specific information at the moment. And this is uh, Dr. Okay. Le this is Dr. Levine. Um, yeah. So we are aware of the uh, Missisquoi hockey team um, and um, another team that was impacted by that uh, hockey team. Um, we do now know that Missisquoi is an example of, as Secretary French said, um, more community transmission means it will appear in the school, will appear on a team, uh, but there does appear to be potentially uh, transmission across to another team. Uh, so that's the only time we've seen that in Vermont thus far. Missisquoi has its outbreak related to the team, it also has a separate number of cases that don't seem to have any connection to the team. So it has, as a high school, been uh, much more extraordinarily impacted by the virus than we generally have seen across schools in the state. Uh, I did want to just add in one piece of information regarding the previous question, um, and that was the uh, uptake of vaccine. The, um, I think one of the big issues uh, for population in general is if they have concern about the vaccine, it's because of the fact that it's so new, that with the mRNA, it was something they weren't familiar with, and because with Operation Warp Speed, it came out uh, to the public's eye so quickly, uh, implying perhaps that corners were cut uh, and uh, that it may not be the safest product, which is far from the truth. And I think the experience that's occurred with it over the course of time has proven that to be true. The, uh, the reason it could come out so quickly was it was a platform that the research community was very well versed in and the clinical community was already well versed in because it was almost used for other epidemics in the past like Ebola. Uh, but didn't need to be because uh, of the lack of uh, a pandemic from, from those kinds of viruses. So if you think that about it, most of these trials that we're relying on the data from began much earlier in 2020. So um, the vaccines obviously became available for use late in December, but that's because they had enough months of follow-up from the trials to allow emergency use authorization. So I think as we find over time, getting into the spring, with more and more months of experience with these vaccines, 
if many people were hesitant because they had the safety concerns or had the concerns about it being so new, they'll begin to continue to see that um, they're used successfully and safely and effectively, uh, and that should help uh, much more than just a separate education effort, just uh, allaying their concerns, because so many people, I do think, want to wait. Even in the 1A group, in some of the healthcare workers, we found people who waited till the end of 1A to get their vaccine, um, and then were happy they did so. So I think now with the uh, passage of time, more and more of that will begin to be true. Just for clarification, who, what was the team that was affected by Ms. Cisco? I, I, last I knew, Essex was the last team to play Ms. Cisco. I, obviously, I know you don't want to out anyone, but the players know, the school certainly knows, classmates know. Yeah, no, it was Essex. Okay. Thank you. Check here, we're at about 12.15, and we have 15 left in the queue. Going to Zuri at NBC5. Uh, what should Vermonters do in the meantime as we wait for more vaccine doses? Should people pre-register for the vaccine even if they aren't eligible just yet? Secretary Smith. You can go on the website and um, and register. You cannot sign up for a slot on the uh, on the website, but you can go on to the website and set up an account. Uh, if you would want to do that, that that would be fine. Or you can wait until um, we set out the, you know, we we call the sort of the age band that you are going to. The governor talked about the 60 to 64 age band. We'll soon be announcing that age band. So if you're in that age band, here's my recommendation right now, is that you go on and set up an account online at um, at the health department's website and make sure that um, you, you have that account. So when we announce it, you can start making appointments uh, within uh, within the scheduling uh, software that we have. But again, um, from right now, we only allow you to schedule an appointment uh, when your age band is called. And, uh, and the next age band, like I said, will be 60 to 64. And as the governor said, that should be coming soon. Okay, thank you. Hi, I want to come back to this idea of back to normal by the 4th of July. What is your definition of normal? Is that all restrictions listed on businesses, large gatherings like weddings being allowed again, no masks, no travel restrictions? Basically, kind of describe what society looks like in your vision for July 4th, as long as the supply continues, the vaccine. Yeah, because I recognize that my definition of normal and yours might differ. Yeah. There, there are a lot of... Um there are a lot of things that come into play uh, with this. I would say, you know, from my standpoint, uh, there may be uh, still advise, advisables, um, guidelines we might uh, uh, put out in terms of uh, mask wearing. I don't think that will be completely over for those who have not been vaccinated, or nor are they willing to be. Uh, they may want to continue uh, to wear uh, a mask. Uh, there may be other restrictions that we're not aware of. For instance, um, I don't know when the border is going to open up uh, between us and Canada and uh, what that's going to mean. Um, I tried to ask that question last week with the White House, but they didn't have a, any uh, definitive answer whether we're going to have some sort of a vaccine passport uh, to come back and forth. Uh, but that could be um, part of uh, the process. But that would be a border restriction. So again, uh, a lot of uh, what ifs, uh, but uh, but I, I, from my standpoint, it's almost like a, we're back to where we were pre-pandemic uh, in terms of having businesses open and being able to freely uh, travel throughout the United States. So for people who are, um, maybe they're an organization trying to plan a summer fundraiser or a person who's trying to plan a wedding, 
should they be saying, okay, my you know late summer wedding or my late summer event is on? From uh, from my uh, standpoint, at this point in time, uh, with the supply uh, that we're seeing, uh, and uh, if everything fits together as we see it, yes. Um, and we'll be able to lay that out again uh, this coming Friday. We'll be talking about the vaccine schedule and the age bands and where, how quickly we think we'll be able to uh, open those up. Uh, and then the following week or two, uh, we'll be able to show you the exit plan. So it'll make a lot more sense by then, Kat. Uh, but, um, but that's where we want to get uh, to some, some sort of normal uh, by the end of that uh, period of time. And I believe that's 4th of July. Thank you. Devin, Local 22. Hi, this is a question for Dr. Levine. Um, I'm seeing that a handful of European countries have suspended uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine, uh, reports of a possible blood clotting side effect. The WHO uh, believes this should continue going on and that there's no evidence that the vaccine is linked to clotting. Um, I'm just curious what your thoughts are on this. And then when reports like this come out, how important it is to kind of describe in detail what's going on um, so people's confidence in the vaccine isn't impacted. Yeah, this is a great question and very timely because um, uh, lots of people are looking at the same data and coming up with varying conclusions. One conclusion is what uh, many of the European countries have come up with, which is they want to be uh, safe than sorry, so to speak, and using what is always termed an abundance of caution, so they're putting a pause on things. Another conclusion is that um, there's actually no difference in the rate of people who are vaccinated getting blood clots than there is in the general population for getting vaccination at all as a factor. Um, I'm sort of subscribing to that one based on the numbers that I've seen. Um, keep in mind also that part of COVID, we don't talk about it a lot um, because it doesn't happen usually to uh, most people, but those who are most seriously ill with COVID and might end up in the hospital, uh, blood clotting is a significant concern. So one has to separate that aspect uh, out as well. Um, and you're trying to use a vaccine to prevent an illness that might cause a serious blood clot, and you certainly don't want the vaccine to do that. I don't think the data currently shows that the vaccine is definitively leading to blood clots, which could harm someone's health, uh, if you uh, look at it very closely. So that's my take at this point in time. And a question for Governor Scott. Um, I'm seeing here that the White House is drawing up plans to surge vaccines to emerging hotspots um, in preparation for a big fourth wave as people are getting vaccinated. Is that something that came up uh, during your call today? And what are your thoughts on that? Uh, how effective of a strategy that could be as we are working to fight the variants and also get people vaccinated? Well, again, that might be a, a, it did not come up on the call this morning with the White House, and it might be a better question for Dr. Levine. In some respects, as we've learned, um, it's almost too late when that happens. When there's a hot spot, uh, there is already transmission, and so um, the vaccine is about a, a month late. Uh, so that's why it's so important uh, for us when you're, uh, when, when your um, age group comes up, uh, that you get vaccinated then. And that's why we've been trying to accelerate and making sure that we get all the vaccines, shots in the arms uh, to protect ourselves so we don't become a hot spot. Um, so we'll learn more about that. I, I'm not aware. My only other thought is that uh, as long as it doesn't disrupt the flow of vaccines into our state, uh, then they can take a, a different path. And maybe that's what they're doing. Maybe they're stockpiling um, doses that we don't know about. And maybe that's what they're planning to do. But, uh, but that didn't come up this morning. I just want to go back to the other, the AstraZeneca, if I could, uh, only to say, uh, just so everyone's very clear, we don't use the AstraZeneca here in the States. Uh, that's not a concern for us here. We have Moderna, 
We have Pfizer, and we have Johnson Johnson. Uh, those have all been approved for emergency use, and AstraZeneca doesn't exist uh, here in the States. So uh, for any of those who are having second thoughts about their vaccination, uh, this should not uh, prevent them from obtaining their vaccination here in the States, here in Vermont. Thank you. Michael VT Digger. Hi, can you hear me okay? We can. Great, thank you. Uh, Governor, a uh, question for you. The Senate approved a bill this morning that would make universal mail-in voting a uh, fixture of the state's general election. Will you support this change? Yeah, I've been, uh, I've been supportive. I think it, it proved to be worthwhile. There was an increase in voter participation. Um, my only concern is if we're going to do it for the general election, I'm, I'm wondering why not the other uh, elections that we have and uh, if it works for the general election, it should work for some of the others. So I would only ask that it get uh, expanded in some capacity. So uh, it can't be what do you mean just about other elections. Well, like town meeting day, for instance. That would include both town oh. meeting and primary. Oh, it does? No, I'm, I'm asking, is that what you mean? Uh, yeah. When you say yeah. expand to yeah. other elections? That's what I'm saying. Okay. That it, I mean, I, I, I know. Uh, for some, the general election is uh, uh, the Super Bowl in some respects, uh, but uh, we have a lot of other games and, and other elections uh, that we, we have along the way in town voting and so forth. So uh, if it's good for uh, the, the big game, uh, then I'm not sure why it isn't, uh, isn't suitable for the others. Great. Thank you. Avery, WCAX. I was hoping we could get an update on teacher clinics. So how many teacher-specific clinics have been held so far and how many are scheduled and when? And if we have an estimate on how many teachers have received a shot so far. Secretary Smith. Yeah, I have this week's total, Avery, which I had mentioned, which is uh, 7,000 this week of uh, teachers and individuals in the group of uh, teachers, school staff, and regulated child care programs. I have a, I, in, in the back of my mind, I, matter of fact, I'm pretty sure this is accurate, 11,700 have registered. I can't tell you how many have actually got um, their shots out of that 11,500 that are registered. This is in the state program. I also know that the federal program, as I said, we're waiting on data from the federal program, but we know that they had nearly 5,000 doses available um, uh, this week. Uh, and we'll get we get reports afterwards in terms of how many um, how many doses of those have uh, been with the education. But I would assume it's bulk the bulk of it is education. And I've at, and as I said, we've added clinics in Essex, Franklin, and Orange counties uh, this week. Uh, Secretary French, I don't have the uh, list of where we are this week in terms of uh, clinics, but I know we did a like a 1,200 um, vaccination site in Burlington yesterday uh, for for education and educators and and uh, school uh, for teachers, uh, school employees, and childcare. Um, Secretary French, do you have anything to add on that? No, I don't. Um, I'm digging up a list. We did do, as you mentioned, the large site at the Doubletree yesterday, over 1,000 uh, doses in the Burlington area. And we have aspects, I think, for Friday. Yeah, a Avery, let me, let me try. Let, let's, um, let's have Secretary French and I try to f find out. I didn't bring that information with me. Okay, thank you. And just to clarify, too, it's still, uh, you all still want teachers to be going to vaccination clinics that are close to their workplace or home, correct? We have uh, set up vaccination sites, and we're, we, we, we would prefer them to go to sites that are close to their home or their school district. But if there's, if there's opportunities, because some people live 
uh, quite a way is the distance from where they work. Um, and there's a vaccination site that's closer to them. They can they can op they can opt to that uh, vaccination site. Thank you. Aaron VT Digger. Confirmed five cases of the variant so far, but kind of since you're just doing a sample of a certain number of tests, do you have like an estimate of the prevalence of the variant in the community or like what percentage of cases are due to the variant at this point? I don't know if we got the first part of that question, but I think it's for Dr. Levine regardless. Yeah, that's a, that's a really great question, Aaron. Um, so when we do whole genome sequencing, we send a certain number of specimens to the CDC every week, which is very minimal. We send a modest number of specimens to the Massachusetts Public Health Lab, pending our lab getting full capacity to do that, which we hope will be uh, within the month. Um, so this is a very small number of specimens when you think about the overall number of positive tests we have across the state. So I, I won't even be able to extrapolate from those numbers to, to give you a prevalence rate because, to be real, we actually are targeting specimens in areas we think are more likely to have uh, the variant based on the clinical characteristics of uh, what's going on in that part of the state or with the people who have experienced the positive tests. So I uh, can't really give you a prevalence, nor can probably anyone in the country give you a prevalence um, because of the fact that it's not a random screening of samples and it's not a really robust distribution of samples um, anywhere in the country at this point. The CDC fortunately has come out in the last week or so with some statements to the effect that um, they understand we're not doing a sufficient amount of uh, searching for the uh, variant strains uh, based on the uh, capacity the country has and want to have that increased and do their and have their own capacity increased as well. So that's a long-winded answer, but basically we don't have an idea of the prevalence. But we should assume because we found five here in Vermont um, that it's probably more prevalent than we would have imagined. And as I've said in the past, Everyone has been saying that by the end of March, it may be the dominant strain in our country. So this is just the tip of the iceberg we're seeing. The good news is we're not finding other strains uh, with the uh, sequences that we've sent to date. Okay. Um, my second question, I, I think it's also for Dr. Levine. Um, I, uh, I got an email from a reader who's trying to hook up their 16-year-old, um, high-risk 16-year-old for the vaccine. And from what I understand, only Pfizer uh, has approval for um, vaccinating 16-year-olds. So how do they figure out whether they're getting the Pfizer vaccine and where they can make an appointment to get it specifically? Yeah. Yeah, no, that's a really good question. So that you are correct. So far, the Pfizer is the only one. I, I see a day in the future when J&J &J may actually be another one because uh, they're extending their trials uh, with the appropriate age group. And then some of the ones that haven't been approved yet may also end up, if they do get approval, getting uh, emergency use authorization for a younger age population as well based on who's enrolled in their trials. Um, so right now, um, if you go on the website and register and what have you, you're not going to be able to see the name of the vaccine at this point in time, though there may be a future time when that will be true. So I would probably rely on the phone call more than anything to try to get a, an idea of what's available at the site that you want to sign up for. We usually try to discourage you from using the phones and encourage you to use the uh, online, but in this case, this is a very special instance. Uh, that would be the way to go. 
And I do know a, a large number of the pharmacies are actually getting Pfizer. Uh, and the reason some of the pharmacies were enrolled in the original um, pharmacy partnership with the federal government when we were delivering vaccines to the long-term care facilities was because they had the freezer capacity to be able to accommodate that vaccine. I also know that um, there are some of the sites that our partners are using across the state that do have Pfizer consistently. Okay, thank you. Peter Hirschfeld, VPR. Peter Hirschfeld. Uh, thank you, Rebecca. My first question is for Dr. Levine. Uh, Dr. Levine, is the state tracking the number of adverse reactions that Vermonters are having to the COVID-19 vaccine? And if so, what qualifies as an adverse reaction and how many have we had? Yeah, so we do track the uh, VAERS system, which is the Vaccine Adverse Effect Reporting System. And the last I saw, which I think was this morning, was 99 instances out of the well over hundreds of thousands um, of vaccinated uh, vaccines delivered. So um, in that system, anything you report is reportable. So it's not like uh, you're restricted in some way. Uh, the goal is to get people to report uh, anything that they need to report. You know, most people aren't going on that system you know, specifically to do something common like uh, pain at the site of the injection, but we're looking for the more um, serious or unusual things. So that's a, that is a purely self-reporting? Uh, yes. Framework? <laughs> All right. Um, and a quick question for Secretary French as well. Secretary French, uh, Senate Education Committee, um, passed out legislation that um, envisions uh, some reforms, significant reforms to Vermont's education funding system. Just hoping to get your uh, general thoughts on the framework that they've laid out. Yeah, I haven't uh, reviewed the specific bill yet, but I think it, um, you know, what we were working on is how to approach the waiting study, uh, which does have some significant implications. So my understanding of the bill is that uh, lays out a committee to um, sort of work on that implementation plan. So I, that's something I've testified in support of. I think uh, the waiting study does deserve uh, some review and, and specifically an implementation plan because its implications are fairly significant. Thank you all very much. Tim, Vermont Business Magazine. It caught me by surprise there a little bit, Rebecca. Sorry about that. Um, the uh, state tax exemption, which Suzanne um, itemized earlier, uh, Governor, while you were at, with the White House call, um, it, she acknowledged that you would have to implement the state tax exemption plan, you would have to go to the legislature. And I'm wondering if you know how much that's going to cost the state, um, whether you support it, and when. Uh, taxpayers could expect to, to know what's going on with that, given that it would have to go through the legislative process? Um, well, first of all, I do like tax uh, decreases, so that would be an area that I would agree to. I think it's going to be around 10 million, I believe, 10, 10 to 12 million um, that it would, uh, would cost the state. Um, we're still not sure uh, whether any of the new funding in this uh, new Recovery Act may, um, we may be able to get reimbursed for that. Just don't know at this point. Uh, it's all too too new, but we want to make sure that we're 
passing on this exemption. Uh, we're decoupled from the federal uh, tax code, as you know. Uh, we did that uh, mm -hmm. probably 15 years ago. Um, so that, that makes it necessary for us to, uh, to go to the legislature. And, and uh, I believe uh, the uh, Commissioner Bolio is going to the uh, Senate Finance Committee to ask for that exemption or that um, any, it, implementation. It, any advice to the taxpayers on, uh, obviously the, the federal is gonna happen uh, fairly quickly, but uh, what should taxpayers do at this point? Just just file and, and um, there'll be some guidance later on. Is Secretary, Bo or Commissioner Bolio, or maybe Secretary Young, one of the two? Commissioner Bolio, uh, are you I on? I am here, Governor, I'm happy with that. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, Governor. Um, so Vermont forms start with adjusted gross income, and as of this law passing uh, at the federal level, um, the unemployment benefits for the first $10,200 for anybody under $150,000 of adjusted gross income is not included in AGI as it flows through to Vermont. As the Governor and uh, Secretary Young articulated, uh, the Vermont legislature has to pass a corresponding law for that tax exemption to, to truly become effective in the state of Vermont. So there is some uncertainty for taxpayers right now, right? Because if they file today, uh, their tax software is going to carry that exemption through. Uh, my best advice is to stay tuned. Um, I am going to talk with the legislature today, and I suspect over the course of the next few days and, and, and hopefully week, we can get a clearer answer on this. And the moment we have certainty, uh, we will provide that on our website and work with uh, software partners if any adjustments need to be made. So um, it's a little bit of a, a, an uncertain situation right now. Taxpayers can still file if they wish, um, but if the legislature ultimately decides not to link up to this provision, uh, we will have to issue more guidance about how to either make adjustments for that or, or get amended returns. Okay, great. That's what I was wondering. Thanks. Joe, the Barton Chronicle. Um, hello. I've got a couple of questions um, from readers that seem to be on a similar theme. The first uh, is a reader who is asking uh, how much of the current apparent outbreak in Orleans County can be attributed to um, the situation at Northern State and uh, what other factors might be um, involved in the high number of cases that we're experiencing right now. Michelle Levine. Yeah, I can't give you a percentage breakdown right now, though I could find that out, but certainly a significant proportion of that outbreak is related to the correctional facility. But I don't want to give the, um, I, I shouldn't say it that way even. There's an outbreak at the correctional facility. A significant proportion of the Orleans County cases come from that outbreak, but uh, not from other outbreaks in Orleans County. Um, thank you. Um, my second question is about the uh, the facilities outbreak as well. Uh, a reader uh, wrote and asked that given uh, the current lack of certainty about um, the ability of people who've been vaccinated to transmit um, the coronavirus, uh, whether inoculating guards is, uh, you know, and other correctional facility, uh, officers is um, sufficient to protect the, the um, incarcerated people who are in the state's custody and their responsibility, not only in, in the Newport facility, but around the state, and whether it might be time to consider vaccinating um, inmates as if they were residents of long-term care facilities. Yeah, so I can handle the beginning of that question because um, you'll recall even when we have vaccinated people gathering with unvaccinated people, um, we're not telling them to all uh, forgo the masks 
at this point in time during uh, our mitigation strategies. And if um, you look at the way our correctional facilities work, um, they've been relying very much on traditional distancing, masking, um, guidance, and mitigation strategies all along. Those aren't being dropped because we put a needle in the arm of one of the correctional officers, uh, and especially not when the correctional officer has just been vaccinated and really hasn't yet built up that immune response. So clearly, in parallel, having the vaccine and continuing to do all of the usual strategies is really the way to go in those facilities, and that will continue to protect everyone um, around. You're on. Go ahead, Ed. Great. Uh, I'm going to back up to a question that Kat asked earlier, just looking at the logistics. Uh, it's one thing for a person to take a chance of setting up a wedding at the end of summer, um, but a lot of events take time to plan for uh, a parade, a uh, church fair, uh, even a county fair. Are uh, those bigger events going to be off the table this time, or we, will you be able to draft uh, regulations to allow those type of events to occur? Um, you know, a lot and of that. How quickly can you do that? Yeah, a lot of that will be determined. And as I said, uh, this uh, coming Friday, we'll be we'll be um, publicizing our vaccination uh, schedule and with the HBNs and so forth, so everyone understands the timeline for that to happen. Uh, and then the, the following week or two, within the next two weeks, um, uh, by the first week in April, we'll be p publicly uh, showing you what our exit strategy is. So a lot of those timelines, a lot of those uh, um, um, gathering limits and so forth will be in that strategy. So it will be apparent at that point uh, what you can do and what you can't and, and an estimated uh, timeline for that to happen. So uh, stay tuned on that. Okay. But, okay, yeah, so you're not absolutely ruling out the potential to have a larger gathering. I'm not at this point. Right. Okay. Very good. Thank you. Tom, Compass, Vermont. Uh, thank you. Governor, when you look at the uh, CDC information regarding delivery of vaccine doses per 100,000 people for each state, I'm wondering if the federal government explains to you why states like Oklahoma and South Dakota are receiving around 50 to 52,000 per 100,000, while Vermont is just at under 47,000. And then the other curiosity is the four states at the highest risk for still being infected uh, are receiving even less, between forty to forty-three thousand per hundred thousand. Do they? Do they give? Are you privy to that information and the explanation of how they do that? We have. I mean, I have not looked at that, um, and I'm looking over at Mr. Pichek. Um, something you want to try and answer? I'll ask uh, Commissioner Pichek to try and answer. You know, it's a, it's a good question. We do watch the um, percent of distribution closely. Vermont, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic was closer to the top. Um, I think early on and even today, some of it boils down to how much of the vaccine can be, uh, is in a shipment or in a box that goes to a state and where those cutoffs are. And for some of the smaller states, we might get the benefit of some extra doses that are beyond our per capita distribution or, or less than that, depending on, you know, what the shipment is. Certainly, though, to your point about the states that have, um, you know, uh, an increased risk because the fewer natural infections. Um, it's certainly a, a good argument uh, to make, but at this point, you know, the per capita distribution um, is the way that the federal government is moving forward. And as you see, we're making pretty good progress on protecting our most vulnerable. So, um, you know, even under this plan, we think we'll get uh, uh, all of our population uh, vaccinated at really good numbers uh, just in the next couple of months. Okay, thanks very much. 
Andrew, Caledonian Record. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, good afternoon. A uh, nursing facility in the kingdom here has an outbreak with uh, two staff and four residents testing positive. Uh, the facility administrator reported to us the residents had about a 90% vaccination rate and staff at 60%. I'm wondering how typical these vaccination rates are compared to the statewide averages. Um, and on the same topic, uh, uh, cases uh, are down significantly in, in these types of facilities, but is there a, a a threshold of vulnerability that that you uh, have determined at this point in terms of vaccination rates and and if so do you have a list of facilities that might be concerning to you because they have lower than average uptake uh, commissioner levine I, I will just say that uh, you know one that sticks out uh, from my perspective on the other end of the scale was i think it was randolph and they had like a 90 percent uptake um, so that was um, that was the gold standard, and we had hoped that other long-term care facility staff members would follow suit, but we know they fell short, I believe, in Bennington as well, which was a concern for us. Dr. Levine. So uh, it's pretty uh, common for the uptake by the residents of long-term care facilities to be very high. 90% um, is actually not an unusual number. Um, I can't give you a facility by facility uh, rate, but it's always in the 80s and 90 percent range. For the staff, um, it's very variable, I have to say. Um, some have been as low as 40 to 50 percent. More, more commonly is in the 60 to 70 percent range. Uh, so not as high as the residents and certainly not as high as some of the other healthcare facilities in the state. Uh, when we commonly talk to our hospitals, they're always, um, with few exceptions, above 70% and most, most frequently in the high 80s and low 90% range uh, amongst their staff. So obviously any um, diminishment in those numbers does provide some vulnerability, as you mentioned. Um, and at a time when communities have more virus to transmit, that vulnerability may end up showing up in the long-term care facility. Fortunately, though, as you've seen by the data, they are not showing up in abundance at long-term care facilities. And maybe we're seeing a little bit of the demonstration, if you will, of community immunity within the walls of those facilities because in aggregate, there are so many people who have been vaccinated that it's less likely for one to transmit virus to another. But we're still very concerned about that. Uh, we do some education as, as needed. Um, we had a very nice sort of town hall uh, in Bennington, as the governor was alluding to, at the Vermont Veterans Home with the staff there. Um, and um, we'll do whatever it takes to get that rate up higher. Okay, uh, thank you. Um, and then I have a second question uh, from a reader um, uh, who, within the last few days, um, my understanding is they, they went to try to reapply uh, for unemployment benefits. Um, they weren't, wasn't 100% clear to me whether this was related to the extension of the unemployment benefits that, the, that were just approved with the rescue plan. Uh, but they ran into um, trouble either connecting by phone or online and what they determined was uh, a necessary reapplication. And they were wondering if the system is in a state of transition to accommodate the new extension or if there's anything in that field. I may uh, refer to Commissioner Harrington on that. Sure. Uh, thank you, Governor, and thanks for the question. So um, there are a couple of different components there. Uh, the uh, American Recovery Plan or Rescue Plan um, actually is obviously in the middle of being rolled out. Uh, individuals are still filing under the existing programs uh, for the remainder uh, of this week, which is actually filing for the prior week. Um, but to your question about the reapplication, what is likely happening is that um, in accordance with uh, both our program and the federal requirements, if someone uh, 
if someone goes through a 12-month period of collecting benefits from the time they originally open their claim, they must refile for benefits uh, at that 12-month mark. Uh, and so there are individuals that are having to open a new claim, uh, which is standard, uh, and uh, reapply for benefits um, because they've gone through the 12-month period. It's not, um, it's not a full application process, but there is... Um, it essentially opening a new benefit year uh, is what is occurring. Uh, and that is, again, uh, redetermining their eligibility based on uh, the wages, if any, that they have um, received over the prior 12 months and, and, that, and, and actually even beyond that uh, based on the, the statute. So there is a necessary uh, opening or reapplication process if they need to open a new benefit year um, because they've gone, it's gone 12 months since their initial claim was opened. I guess that suggests a follow-up then, um, given where we are in the calendar and the start of the pandemic. Uh, are you expecting a bubble of reapplications uh, to be coming in short order? And uh, is the system prepared to handle it if there is one coming? Sure, uh, we are and we have been planning for that. Unfortunately, you can't open a new benefit year until your existing year expires. Um, and so we do expect that there will be, as you said, a, a bubble, but, but an increase, especially over um, the latter weeks in March and uh, the first few weeks in early April, um, where a number of individuals who have been filing consistently since last uh, March and April will now hit that one year mark. Uh, when they, when their claim, uh, expires, uh, they will receive a notification, uh, from the department that their claim has expired and that they need to file under a new benefit year. Uh, and there is a method for how to do that. So we will be sending them, uh, uh, you know, a detailed description of what the steps are in that process. Okay. Thank you, everyone. In, in regards to Andrew's uh, previous question about long-term care facilities, just a message to all the media and those listening, uh, it's not too late. If you are a staff member at a long-term care facility and you chose not to, uh, for whatever reason, decided not to get your vaccination uh, when it was offered before, it's still on the table. So we encourage you to do so. Uh, this is um, would be beneficial to not only those in the in the facility, but to you personally. It gives you a lot of benefits in terms of mobility, uh, seeing others, and seeing uh, your kids, and grandkids, and so forth. So, uh, we encourage you to take advantage of that. All right, we have a couple more. We're circling back to uh, Eric at the Times Argus. Yes, Governor. This is a quick question on vaccine doses. Uh, you said the state's going to be looking at hundreds of more doses. How many are have this has the state received this week? Well, we didn't this week. We didn't receive Johnson and Johnson, so I'm not sure how many. Just north of sixteen thousand. Okay, six about sixteen thousand of the Pfizer and, and Moderna. Okay. Does that include the second dose, or is that sixteen thousand? That's sixteen thousand first dose. The other is not okay. really. And so when you say that we're. Okay. So the, the announcement today is the, the hundreds of doses on top of that amount. That's correct. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Guy Page. Thank you, Rebecca. Governor, Secretary Smith discussed a working group to help Vermont's homeless long term. Representative Dave Iacovoni of Morristown on the Appropriations Committee recently said that allocating the state government share of the Recovery Act could be invested heavily in COVID related housing. So I'm wondering, um, is the state planning to merely extend payment for hotels and motels and build shelters with all of those new federal dollars? Or are you expecting a strategy to reduce homelessness long term? Yeah, I mean, our goal would be to reduce homelessness um, in the long term, uh, and we have to consider both. And and if it's uh, if we have the flexibility, and I'm not sure what the rules will allow us to do, uh, but I'd rather build housing uh, than to provide temporary housing uh, in more long term. 
uh, to help those in need. So that would be my strategy, but, um, but it's good for all of us to get together. And, uh, and I think we all have the same goal, uh, is to make sure, you know, we, in the short term, protect people, long term, um, make sure that they have a, a, a place to go to um, and, and not just a temporary facility. So short term protect, long term a place to go to. Okay. Um, Governor, I, Vermonters appreciate that when you come directly from the White House calls, we have just one degree of separation from the president and, and you're it. Um, on any of these calls, have the president or the governors discussed asking the Chinese government to provide more transparency on how the virus developed? Yeah, uh, first of all, uh, the president has not been on any of these calls, uh, these eight calls that we're on on a weekly basis. It's just the governor, governors and uh, uh, some of the CDC members and um, um, others okay. in the White Thank House. You. So, uh, and, and that has not come up in any of these calls. Is that something you might want to bring up? Uh, not on these call, calls, uh, but I know uh, that uh, it's a concern of many. I mean, we, you know, as we, um, in the aftermath, we need to know what happened, I believe, and, uh, and so that it doesn't replicate and happen again. Thank you. Of, of these numbers, you know, where we are in the pandemic right now, you know, vaccines ramping up, more people are potentially getting back to work in the next few months, and it potentially, you know, will ever return to pre-pandemic unemployment. Well, you know, just with the, with the measure that they're using today, 3.2%, uh, we were down pre-pandemic around 2%, lowest in the country. Uh, previous to that, but that doesn't tell the whole story. And I said it then, I'll say it again now. Um, you really should look at, you need to look at employment numbers. Uh, that's what you should be looking at. And we still have upwards to 30, over 30,000 people who are on unemployment or uh, in some traditional UI or a PUA, uh, but they're not working. Uh, so we need to make sure that we put people back to work. So that's the number I like to look at. Um, as well, after the pandemic is over and people do get back to work, we're still going to be have this shortage of workers. The workforce is the problem. We had when we had two percent unemployment, uh, we still had jobs available. We had more jobs available than we had people to fill them. And that will be the case when we um, you know exit this uh, this pandemic. And that's something that we I'm concerned about, and we should all be working on to try and bring more people in, into the state uh, and to try and solve that issue, the demographic issue that we have and uh, bring more uh, people into the workforce. Uh, yes, uh, we got a viewer question that I, since we're at the end of the uh, press conference here, I can ask. A uh, gentleman uh, has made his appointment and everything, uh, but he doesn't know if there's any sort of situation, he has no transportation. And he was wondering, is there some sort of a plan in place for folks who, uh, you know, want to get the vaccine but can't get to uh, a place to get one. Yeah, I know we have uh, a, a program for the homebound, but I don't know if this is the same. Yeah, um, um, I would I would advise them to call the call center, and we'll try to remember. Steve, I would advise. There's two programs. One, we have a homebound program which he can call and. Um, and get, um, if he's homebound, get to there. But this sounds like a transportation issue more than a homebound issue. I would, I would urge them to uh, go ahead and call our call center uh, to make sure, see if they can accommodate some sort of transportation for, the indi for this uh, particular individual. Um, I think, uh, you know, we've been pretty successful in lining people up. And the call center number is 855-722-7878. Let's just see if we can help that person um, uh, with with transportation. Uh, uh, you know, there we have plenty of uh, services out there. Maybe we can we can uh, connect this person with our transportation alternatives. Well, for instance, some of the public transportation has those right uh, those those special transportation yeah. um, buses. That maybe we can work on that. 
Thank you. Okay. With that, thank you very much for tuning in, and we'll be back on Friday and provide you some details on our vaccination plan um, throughout the next two or three months. Thank you very much.